my intent this morning is to further the objective of helping the world appreciate what it is that all of you do. And to show that appreciation, the world can do so through maps. So I'm going to show you some maps that derive from the work that I've been doing over the last few years in studying global connectivity and urbanization. If you actually map out all of the world's transportation, energy, and communications networks, for example, here are all of the world's highways and railways, and you can layer on top of that all of the world's oil and gas pipelines and electricity grids, and of course, let us not forget the world's internet cables, though, in fact, they have just been forgotten. But here they are. If you put them all together, what you will find is that the man-made infrastructure of the world that we have ourselves built outnumbers all of the world's political divisions, all of the world's borders, by about 150 to 1. <clears throat> and yet, in your offices, in our children's classrooms, on your walls at home, your maps focus on division, not on connection. But you are in the business of building global connectivity, and our maps should reflect that, and we should appreciate it. In fact, to me, the scale of global infrastructure today really represents what I call an exoskeleton that we have been building around the planet. And it really is like uh, systems of the human body, as I describe it here, a skeletal system, an energy system, uh, and a nervous system wrapping around the body. This represents a true evolution in cartography. We are all familiar with maps of natural geography and of political geography, but we are moving into an age in which what matters more than both of those is functional geography or perhaps they're equally important. But to appreciate the complexity of the world today, we have to take all three into account. So rapidly are we building out the world's infrastructure that I have been um, leading a process to build what is called a connectivity atlas. You can go online, it's free and open to the public, and explore and navigate uh, all of the world's mega infrastructures from those categories. And you can toggle on and off and zoom in and out. And we are constantly up, up, updating the data from this because we are indeed building the world so rapidly. What is driving all of this? It's really the story of the past 100 years when we have had the ability to topographically engineer the planet. And our cities are the foremost examples of this, but all of these other infrastructures too. Together, what we see is that already mankind spends two to three times more on infrastructure than we do on defense and military affairs. And that has grown from the phase of history 100 years ago where the US was in the lead and became the world's uh, preeminent power through the period after World War II when Europe needed to rebuild and took over the lead in global infrastructure spending, to the past quarter century in particular, when we think back to the rise of the Asian tigers and, of course, of China. And now, with the Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank and the One Belt, One Road, which we'll be hearing about today, we see that this infrastructure investment is really spilling even further across borders right here in Asia, starting from China and outward. Again, if we take a step back, this represents a genuine evolution in the organization of mankind. You could be forgiven for having a historical mindset that is limited to the last 150 or 200 years and believing that the world has always been organized according to national boundaries and states, but that is not true. Cities are our most ancient social um, uh, uh, so infrastructural fact, if you will. They are far more real than borders. We have had cities for five or six thousand years. Empires rise and fall, nations come and go. We always have cities. Mankind is becoming what I call a global network civilization among these cities. 
And so I would like to map out some of them with you here. This is the corridor that connects Seattle all the way, or Vancouver all the way to Seattle. Some call it the Cascadia Corridor. Then there is the greater region of Silicon Valley, which is very, very fast growing. Then there is greater Los Angeles, which now extends really south all the way to San Diego and even across the Mexican border. There is the uh, northeastern megalopolis, as it's known in the United States, the belt from Boston through Washington and Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. So uh, Boston through New York and Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., um, which is, of course, America's largest economic archipelago, if you will. And it is one of many examples, such as the previous ones for Southern California, where you can see the dire need for in increasing infrastructure investment to optimize, to create greater efficiencies, to have more livability uh, for all of the 70 uh, mil or so million people who live in this area. Moving all the way across the world to where we are now, to, um, to Asia, the world's largest megacity region for decades, as you all know, has been Tokyo. Um, and in fact, many people think of this megalopolis as stretching from Tokyo all the way to Osaka. But here we are in China, where we find the largest number of megacities. I think you can all see where we are on this map, and you also know that the Bohai Rim around Beijing, the Pearl River Delta from Guangzhou to uh, Hong Kong, and of course, in the middle, the Chongqing Chengdu megacity cluster that is emerging very, very rapidly and growing by the day. So indeed, as John said, China is home to the world's largest of the megacity clusters, and therefore, it is the place that we need to study the most closely. But let me also show you how this is indeed a truly worldwide phenomenon. India is urbanizing as rapidly as China ha is. The greater Delhi region, what's called the Delhi capital region, as well as greater Mumbai, are two of India's several megacity clusters. Even in the Middle East, I find this to be um, uh, an area of the world that is actually already the most urbanized. In fact, the highest percentage of people already living in cities you find on two continents, South America and in the, in the Middle Eastern region. So I've highlighted at the top greater Tehran. Tehran is a very, very rapidly growing city that is almost engulfing the areas around it. Almost one quarter of Iran's population has moved into the what's called the Tehran Karaj uh, area. Then I've highlighted the uh, what I call the, the Persian Gulf necklace that stretches actually from Bahrain and Qatar all the way along the Gulf Coast through Abu Dhabi and Dubai and eventually to Muscat in Oman. This is, as with previous examples, crossing national boundaries. And the fact is that infrastructure, investment, and the desire for connectivity among peoples and among cities is an ancient impulse. It does not re uh, respect political boundaries. In fact, countries want this to happen. They want to build these corridors to unite. Um, and then, as you can see in the Nile River region, you have uh, Cairo all the way to Alexandria, which contains, again, most of Egypt's entire population is there. So that, too, is a, a megacity region. And then an example, perhaps for ULI uh, 2020 or 2025, uh, 25 is uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Again, where are the political boundaries here? In fact, if you travel uh, to uh, Lagos, you can witness the construction of this corridor that is uh, spanning, eventually going to span the boundaries through the transportation networks of Benin, of, to of Togo, of Ghana, all the way to the Ivory Coast. It won't be one city with one name, but it reflects the, the power of the city of Lagos to be the magnet for the entire region. If you take the projections of the World Bank or the United Nations out to the year 2030, 
you can see that there est estimate that there will be about uh, 48 or so or 50 megacity clusters in the world. So we could reconvene in 14 years and this will still be the map of the principal uh, megacity hubs of the world. Now, often when I show this slide, the first thing people say is, what about Australia? How could you forget Australia? Bear in mind, don't, don't be alarmed. <laughs> As you well know, the entire population of Australia could fit in greater Jakarta. It is not necessarily good or bad to be on this map. To be on this map is to say that you are a very, very large urban agglomeration. It is not to say that you are a well-governed, well-run society, country, or city. But I want to emphasize just how important economically these mega city hubs are. Again, why do we have political maps on our walls when we could actually produce maps that show us where we are? Where is human civilization? How are we distributed? That's what this map does. It shows you every human being in the entire world. And as you can see, these urban archipelagos, particularly along coasts, remind us that we are not first and foremost a civilization divided into nations and boundaries. We are a coastal urban species by and large. And these ovals reflect uh, from the previous map the key megacity hubs. But importantly, and this is where we'll get into where it really gets to the heart of what you do in your investments in industry, <laughs> the circles show you the share of the national GDP represented by just that one city or the prominent city. And you can see particularly in developing countries and emerging markets like Brazil, like Nigeria, like the Philippines, Indonesia, and so forth, just one city can represent 50% of the entire national GDP. Even in developing, even in developed countries and advanced economies like the United Kingdom, we all know very well uh, that, that, that the city of London represents almost half of uh, GDP. Again, is this a good thing or a bad thing? To my mind, it is an indication that we need to be investing so much more in secondary cities, in harnessing national populations. Because in a case of a country like Indonesia, you have a population of over 200 million people, and yet most of the economy is centered on one city. Some of the work that we do at the Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore is around collecting data on labor productivity in Asian cities and provinces. And for countries like the Philippines or Indonesia, we have a hard time getting data at all about secondary cities. There hasn't been enough investment in them. And of course, the data that we have on the primary cities is not very positive or, or you know, optimistic because these cities are far too uh, congested and crowded with insufficient infrastructure. So the case has to be made for continuing on that path, that upward slope that I showed you at the beginning of a significant continuation of the increase in infrastructure investment around the world. China, as we all know, has, has devoted more resources than any country to this effort. Even though China has millennia of unique uh, provincial linguistic and cultural histories, they are nonetheless administratively embarking on the path of reorganizing uh, around these functional urban clusters. We know very well that there are significant costs and externalities socially and environmentally. But at the same time, the quality of life that, of improvement that China has delivered is of course tied up to some extent with this urbanization. And what is more, in an age of such significant economic volatility, John mentioned the competition among cities as an example of that. Cities that are of a larger size, somewhere between 5 million and 10 million people, are going to have a larger services share of the GDP uh, and therefore be more resilient to the kinds of demand shocks that the world economy has experienced in the last decade. 
For example, in the United States, New York and Los Angeles have been the fastest to rebound from the financial crisis with the least loss of jobs and the, fa and the most rapid ability of people to resort to themselves in the economy and find new employment. So that is something that China asp aspires to do with developing these megacities. But for the rest of the world, as I've been emphasizing throughout, and also for China, megacities are places that are hard to generalize about. They embody such incredible disparity. Um, to me, when I spend time in a place like a Lagos or a Sao Paulo or a Jakarta, you're not in one city. You're in six or seven different cities every half hour or one hour, depending on where you are. And of course, it takes hours to get from point A, a to point B in those cities. So you have to remember that our cities are embody the, the brutal inequality that is such a feature of domestic economies today. Indeed, income inequality internationally has gone down, but income inequality domestically has gone up. You may remember 10 or 15 years ago, there were such intense anti-globalization protests around the world, the World Bank, IMF, World Economic Forum, those have all gone away. People don't protest those summits anymore. They were railing against international inequality, but that has indeed shrunk. What has replaced it is Occupy Wall Street, Gezi Park in Istanbul, New Delhi, Sao Paulo. You see it every day in the news, such enormous inequality within our national boundaries, within our cities. And that is what we have to invest in overcoming. I see a lot of hope, actually, in the potential for us to invest in the leading urban centers and for those great global cities to embody the best in human nature and to reflect our capacity to absorb more people and more diverse populations from around the world. In fact, throughout history, whether it is ancient Athens or Renaissance Amsterdam or London or Toronto or Singapore or Dubai today, the great cities of the world are open, tolerant, inclusive, investing in their people. And that, of course, uh, means that they are investing in the infrastructure. So I want to wrap up by painting or leaving you with an optimistic image of the world. I don't believe that nations and boundaries will go away, but I do believe that a world of connected cities has a very different psychology from a world governed by nations and empires that seek territorial aggrandizement. Instead, cities realize, and the leaders of cities realize, that connectivity is a source of wealth. You can't even measure the economic value of major cities without factoring in the role of trade, of capital, of people, of talent, of technology that flows in these corridors between major cities in the world. And therefore, I call it the Pax Urbanica, the peace among cities. We have had periods of history like this before, in fact, on a regional scale. But today on every continent, we have cities that think like this, uh, that, that want to be more connected and that realize that connectivity is not a zero-sum game. There is competition, but it is not zero-sum. The more great cities that we have and the more connected that those cities are, the better off every society ultimately becomes. And so that is what I believe is, uh, is part of what your mission is, what you are doing as or more successfully than any other organization in the world. And therefore, I'm delighted to be here uh, with you today. So thank you very much for tolerating my voice, and I look forward to spending the day with you. Thank you so much.